Okay, I guess it's uh, about 8 o'clock, so I'm going to say good morning, everybody. Uh, Dr. Broussard wanted me to talk about the Tamar Wallaby and its relevance to uh, androgen metabolism in the fetus and 21 hydroxylase deficiency. But I thought that it might be a little, I'll mention the Tamar Wallaby later on. I know you're all hot to find out about that. But there are some problems with the adrenal gland that because we've had hydrocortisone for about uh, 70 years now, people are forgetting. And my subtitle there, uh, Adrenal Insufficiency, Still a Cause of Morbidity and Death in Childhood. Uh, I got a phone call last winter. I had been out of town, and I came back and had a message that a mom that I took care of her daughter in 1979 wanted me to give her a call. And she had been a wonderful kid. She had 21 hydroxylase deficiency. Uh, when she became a teenager, she sort of didn't like to take her medicine anymore. And as a young adult, didn't take her medicine a lot. And mom wanted me to talk with her because she had died suddenly with influenza. She was beloved by her co-workers, 30-some-odd uh, years old, obviously, if I took care of her in 79. And it was just really sudden death from adrenal insufficiency. Uh, Dr. Bocchini and I had a little patient. It's patient number one in the things that I talk about later on that we had many years ago. Uh, I sort of have fun with this little guy with uh, talking about the adrenal gland with the junior students. He illustrates a lot about glucocorticoid metabolism. We saw him when he was three. Uh, he died suddenly when he was about five adrenal insufficiency. And I can list off about five more patients that have died suddenly in spite of the parents doing and following what we tell them to do. So it's still a problem and cannot be taken lightly. Uh, so what I'd like you to be able to do when you get done with this is to be able to talk about some idea of where our current ideas of the adrenal gland came from. and talk about adrenal cortical structure and function and realize there are different structures or different functions from fetal life and infancy and childhood and identify clinical correlates of adrenal insufficiency and outline the management of adrenal insufficiency. So I don't have any conflicts of interest in talking about this and I'm not going to suggest any off-label uses of medications. Uh, now, everybody's going to look at this picture and say, Dr. McVie, why are you talking about somebody who is really the father of ENT? Obviously, Bartomello Eustachio described the Eustachian tube, right? Of course he did. That's what he's famous for. He actually, in his day, wasn't famous for anything. He did beautiful anatomical drawings and copper plate prints. But because he was in a small town in Italy that was a papal state, they weren't allowed to be published beyond the papal state could keep them because they were from autopsies, which were illegal, and you weren't supposed to do that. Beautiful work. But he outlined that the adrenal gland should have been called the eustachian gland. It's not. He outlined that the adrenal gland was separate from the kidney, and he used magnifying techniques. He used dissecting techniques to try to differentiate what was going on. Uh, so that was in about 1563. And then in the early 1600s, Spignalius described the capsulae renales. And they really didn't know what they did. They thought they were sort of a space keeper. They exist to sort of give a little bit of room between the stomach and the kidneys, and between the liver and the kidneys. They take up space there. Other people thought from their autopsies that they were perhaps repositories for black bile. So they were doing autopsies on people who have died probably of overwhelming sepsis with adrenal hemorrhage, because that would be black bile. Uh, and it wasn't until about 
300 years after these guys, uh, that the cortical and medullary substances were ident differentiated to some extent from anatomical and physiological points of view. And then in 1855, Addison described uh, his classic work on Addison's disease. And then in 1863, and everybody knows this, Decreccio described uh, the autopsy that he performed on a person who was born identified as a girl, grew up as a male, and died during a either local legend had it that he died of a broken heart when the girl that he proposed to marry turned him down because things weren't quite right. Uh, however, he also had an episode of severe diarrhea that was going through. Uh, at autopsy, he had hugely enlarged adrenal glands, a uterus, fallopian tubes, and ambiguous uh, external genitalia, suggesting that he was the first case of 21 hydroxylase that was really described. And then Artur Bidel, the father of Hungarian endocrinology, showed that the adrenal cortex is of vital importance. The medulla is important, but the adrenal cortex really is the uh, organ that contributes a lot to keeping us alive. And Bidel is the Bidel of bidel bardet syndrome, who described those cases. So it's sort of a lot of fun stuff. Now, this is a picture. I had to hunt on the web pretty wide. It's, there's not a lot of pictures of Lawson Wilkins around in the United States. He's one of the fathers of pediatric endocrinology. And he is here at the first birthday party. So you can imagine this poor baby. She is the first girl treated with hydrocortisone for the management of 21 hydroxylase deficiency. So she probably spent her first year of life in the hospital. And uh, two researchers at Johns Hopkins are saluting her on her first birthday. And it was from 1950 to 1980 that the enzymology of adrenal hyperplasia was worked out. And since 1980, the molecular biology of the adrenal gland has been worked out. And that has made just about every endocrinologist who was brought up from the 1960s to the 2000s liars, because we've all lied to you extensively about the uh, enzymology of the adrenal gland. There's no cell in the adrenal gland, that, no single cell, that does all those things you see on those pictures we draw. So I apologize, but hey. So fetal development. Uh, I'm going to just mention to you DAX1. This is involved in both testicular and adrenal development. A DAX1 mutation, a deleting mutation, is a cause of adrenal hypoplasia. And our adult colleagues have a pair of brothers uh, that are now adults that were identified with that. And we have a pair of brothers that are about nine and six years old now that uh, were identified with that. DEX1 is interesting. The mutation or deletion causes adrenal hypoplasia, lack of development of the adrenal gland, but a duplication results in XY sex reversal. And it can occur along with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and glycerol kinase as a big gene deletion. Uh, so that would be the adrenal hypoplasia that occurs with that. And DAX1 and SF1, these are both involved in adrenal development and gonadal development. So DAX1 is a dosage-sensitive sex reversal atypical nuclear receptor. And a third of boys with X-linked adrenal hypoplasia congenita have a deletion of DAX1. They can have a wide range of presentations. Uh, primary adrenal insufficiency, or later on they may have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism or infertility. They may have isolated mineralocorticoid deficiency. Uh, rarely they can have premature sexual development. Or they may have adrenal insufficiency or delayed puberty in girls that have skewed X inactivation of uh, 
or a gene conversion that results in uh, complete DEX1 deficiency. SF1 is the nuclear receptor expressed in the adrenal, gonads, ventromedial hypothalamus, gonads, and spleen. Primary adrenal insufficiency and XY female streak gonads and a uterus occur in these boys and primary adrenal insufficiency in an XX girl. Uh, the XY DSD can have inguinal testes, no uterus. They may have a uterus or streak gonads. They may have severe perineoscrotal hypospadias, micropenis, undescended testes, male infertility, and or primary ovarian insufficiency in the girls. So these are things that have come along since the 1980s that can occur that you may not have heard of. So how does the adrenal cortex develop? And this little cartoon that I stole from the internet, and I give it credit at the end, is uh, another lie told by endocrinologists and our colleagues. Uh, however, there is some truth in it. Uh, if the fetal adrenal was actually proportional to the adult adrenal, it would be about five times bigger and would take up most of the slide and it wouldn't fit because the fetal adrenal is about 50 times the relative size of an adult adrenal uh, relative to the size of the body. So it's about four or five times bigger. And you can see the adrenal medulla isn't formed in the fetus. It's just little streaks actually on the outside. If you look in the first trimester, it's starting to come in a little bit in the second trimester and still very streaky even up to birth. And it's really not completely encapsulated by the adrenal gland until over a year of age. But when you look at this, uh, you know, we can see that we get definitive mineralocorticoid production starting in the transitional zone somewhere in the third trimester. And we get definitive 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase uh, activity in the second trimester. So Dr. McVie, I know you're all asking this, what prevents the female fetus from being masculinized in the first trimester when there's no 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase in the adrenal gland to make glucocorticoids? What's going on here? Because all you're telling us about is DHEA sulfate. And we know that DHEA sulfate goes to the placenta, is aromatized, and made into estrogens. Well, then, after birth, that fetal zone disappears, and the fasciculata, glomerulosa, and reticularis show development gradually. And finally, at about three to five years, it looks like a mature adrenal gland. But what's going on in this first trimester? And why is it important? Well, sexual differentiation occurs in the first trimester. That's when you have fusion of the labia skirtle folds and development of a phallic urethra starting at about 60 days post-conception and going on up to about 10 weeks. So they did some very beautiful studies, Gaudo et al., in Britain. Uh, they obtained uh, materials from fetuses and studied uh, the development of uh, the steroid enzymology and the activation factors, the nerve growth factor, NGF1 beta, and looked at it as they could obtain the samples. And they showed that if you go at 41 days post-conception, there's no 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. At 50 to 52 days, you're getting a tiny bit. Eight to nine weeks post-conception, when things are most sensitive, you're getting feedback and you're getting cortisol synthesis. And then as the time goes on, by 14 weeks, both the enzymatic activity and the nuclear factor activity are gone. So they develop concurrently, glucocorticoid is made concurrently, and then it disappears 
until about eight weeks later. And this is what protects the baby, this developmental, very brief interlude of 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase activity that allows cortisol to be made over the time when the genitalia are sensitive to the effects of 5-alpha-dihydrotestosterone. So it's uh, sort of fun to see that question finally answered because we really didn't understand it. So the neonate, this zone, this fetal zone is undergoing apoptosis like crazy and by about three months it is gone and you are starting to see the reticularis and the fasciculata coming in. The machinery during the third trimester for cortisol and aldosterone production in a normal fetus is completely intact. It doesn't have to be used much, but it's completely intact. And if the baby comes out early, it's there. Well, another thing we talk about is adrenarche. People have heard of precocious adrenarche, and people think, well, that's something where people start to get body hair before puberty. And we usually think of it occurring at about eight years of age. Well, this was another problem where people weren't quite looking at it correctly. Because what was happening, people were looking and saying, this is going to happen at eight years of age. And we base it on the assays we're using because this is when we see DHEA sulfate and DHEA starting to rise. They were using adult assays. The assays were set to detect the normal adult range of DHEA and DHEA sulfate. The pediatric ranges are much lower. And if you actually lower your assay sensitivity and look at the samples, by the time kids are about three years old, they're starting to have rises in their DHEA and DHEA sulfate, just very gradual. So it's not like all of a sudden there's a bump and you're in adrenarche. It's just something that's been happening very gradually over time. We don't know exactly what it is. There's speculation about the growth hormone and IGF-1 axis. That speculation is contributed to by the observations that if we get relatively obese children, their IGF-1s are usually very uh, robust and they also have a higher incidence of precocious adrenarche. But the exact mechanisms that result in some children develop precocious adrenarche are not identified. And, you know, it's one thing I beg, if you do ever order lab tests in kids that involve steroid hormones or gonadotropins, please make sure that you order the lab tests that have normal values for pediatrics because it's very easy to just check testosterone. And you'd be amazed at the number of ref referrals we get for a 10-year-old boy who's testosterone deficient. Well, probably the normal level of testosterone in that kid is less than 10 or maybe around 10. And if you have an assay that measures 60 to 1,000, 10 will be deficient. But the kid is normal. So adrenal insufficiency. And I'm not going to talk too much about adrenal <coughs> hyperplasia because we talk about that a lot. We've identified a lot more than 21 hydroxylase, 11 hydroxylase, 17 hydroxylase. And I've given their... Uh, real names next to them. Uh, they are fun to talk about, but I think the other things we need to visit are the central problems where we have tumors, we have birth defects, we have trauma, we have infections. That's why I mentioned adrenal hypoplasia, SF1, uh, DAX1. They can affect the central nervous system, they affect directly uh, the adrenal gland and the testis. We should talk about adrenal leukodystrophy. It's uh, not a common disease, uh, but it does affect people. And if I've seen four of them in the years that I've been here, uh, that puts it in an unusual but not completely rare category. Uh, we have autoimmune problems. 
uh, autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome one and two. Uh, one, an air uh, uh, mutation, mutation in the air gene, mucocutaneous candidiasis, hypoparathyroidism, hepatitis, pernicious anemia, chronic fungal infections, and diabetes can occur in here, APS2, hypothyroidism, pubertal delay, diabetes, vitiligo, that's usually inherited more as a recessive. So we've got these syndromes that we need to keep in our mind may be associated with adrenal insufficiency. Now, where did we get, besides me having a few cases of kids who died suddenly, uh, which is a tragedy, uh, I can think of more children dying suddenly of adrenal insufficiency. What does everybody think of the deadly disease for pediatric endocrinologists? I guess it would be diabetes. Well, I can think of several of my patients who have died of diabetes. Uh, one really wasn't mine. Two, two of them actually came in and died in their initial ketoacidosis. Uh, they weren't managed here. Uh, so that does kill children. And then I can think of three suicides because they got depressed and depression kills children as much as anything else. And I can think of a couple of kids that I know of that as adults uh, died of their diabetes, which is tragedy. But relatively speaking, I can come up with more adrenal insufficiency because I have a lot of kids with diabetes and not as many kids with adrenal disease. So the, and you can develop adrenal insufficiency not only from your body doing it to you, primary or secondary syndromes, but chronic steroid use. If you give somebody a lot of shots of Celestone, you may make them adrenally insufficient and put them at risk for tragedy. Kids have become adrenally insufficient on nasal sprays that are absorbed systemically. Kids have developed adrenal insufficiency from topical application of steroids with occlusive dressings. So these are things that uh, you have to remember and you have to worry about a little bit. Uh, I apologize to the junior students that I showed this slide to yesterday. Uh, so there are some symptoms and signs. Uh, any of us in the clinic, do we ever have patients complain about being weak and tired? They don't have any appetite, they're nauseated. They have stomach aches. They have myalgia, they don't feel good. Arthralgias, they get dizzy when they stand up. I think craving for salt would be a giveaway, but I'm an endocrinologist, so I'm always asking about it. If you're salt, you're pickle juice, you're suspect to me, but, you know. I have a lot of headaches. I can't remember things as well as I used to. I've been depressed lately. I think all of us hear those complaints in the clinic every day. And the problem is, some of those patients may have adrenal disease. And when this particular study was done, uh, it was uh, 2003 that it was published, the average time from when a patient went doctoring to the time they were finally diagnosed with adrenal insufficiency was two years. So it can be tried quite a trial for the people. Well, what do you find when you look at them? They may have increased pigmentation. They may be hypotensive, tachycardic. They may have very high fevers that make no sense to you because their cultures are negative and you can use every antibiotic in the world and the darn fevers don't go away. They may have decreased body hair if they have central adrenal insufficiency. They may have ACTH and gonadotropin deficiency, they lose their DHEA, they lose their sex steroids, and they to some extent lose their body hair. If it's autoimmune, they may develop vitiligo or alopecia and lose their body hair. 
They may have some features of uh, hypopituitarism, amenorrhea, or cold intolerance. The cold intolerance could be hypothyroidism due to autoimmune disease also, as well as central. Clinical problems. It's very common to have a rapid heart rate. It's scarier if they have a slow heart rate because things may be getting ready to go down the proverbial tube at that point. They may have these fevers and signs of ongoing inflammation with no obvious source and they're getting treated with all sorts of things. They may have multiple problems, liver dysfunction, kidney dysfunction, they may be hypoglycemic. And we have the little bunch of things that are the real clues, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, hypoglycemia, eosinophilia, and elevated thyrotropin levels if they happen to also have autoimmune thyroid disease. So these are all things that, if somebody's being very vague, see if you find any of them. Maybe life-saving. Now when you get into the ICU, these are the people who are the ICU attending. I don't see any with us today. The ICU attending is there and saying, this patient is 10 times sicker than they should be at this point in the course of the disease. This makes no sense. I've never seen anybody do this before. I've taken care of 100 cases of whatever. I've never ever done this. So you have a huge discrepancy between the severity of the disease that somebody who's experienced thinks there should be and where the patient is. Hypotension, dehydration, abdominal pain, long-term history of fatigue and weight loss, high fevers, no response, mental changes, and then the vitiligo, altered pigmentation, loss of body hair, hypogonadism, hypothyroidism, and then those bunch of lab tests that I keep coming back to, hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, neutropenia, and eosinophilia. There are things that we can look at easily. So this first patient, I mentioned him, he was three years old, he was in another hospital, and he had a past history of an infected VP shunt. He had had a very severe Arnold Chiari and had had surgery for that and had to be shunted. Uh, but his cultures were negative, but he was having temps to 102 degrees every day. Dr. Bocchini had been called over to see him. This was back in the early 80s, and he wasn't hyperthyroid, and he had 15% eosinophils. Well, if fevers and eosinophils isn't a slam dunk for an infectious disease person, I don't know what is. But Dr. Bocchini said, yeah, get, call McVie. He, he's not mine. We've looked at everything. The kid didn't have parasites, didn't have any known infection. And one of the odd things that Dr. Bocchini knew was that we didn't quite have it all worked out in the early 1980s, and it's not all worked out completely now, but high fevers and eosinophils are associated with glucocorticoid deficiency. Part of the high fevers are the glucocorticoid regulation of cytokine production. And cytokines downregulate, glu uh, glucocorticoids downregulate downregulate cytokines. Uh, so if you have high fevers for no great reason, well, you could have a primary cytokine regulation syndrome, kind of rare, but they occur, or you could have glucocorticoid deficiency, worthwhile investigating. And glucocorticoids also cause apoptosis of the precursor cells for eosinophils. So if you put somebody on a high dose of glucocorticoids, their allergies get better sometimes, don't they? And their eosinophils go way down. So uh, we went over and we saw this little guy and his morning and evening cortisol levels were low. His plasma renin activity was normal because he had central ACTH deficiency. Uh, he had no rise in cortisol to ACTH stimulation and his adrenal insufficiency, the clue were the fevers and the eosinophilia. And he did well, but I guess he got an intercurrent illness that was missed and probably died of uh, adrenocortical 
uh, crisis. Uh, you know, his mom said he had a cold, but he didn't have a fever. You know, and I talked to her afterwards, and uh, he died in his sleep one night. So, first patient. The second guy, and I'm not joking about it being 3.30 on a Friday afternoon. I know that's the classic joke. You get the call from the outside hospital at 3.30 on a Friday afternoon. Did the speaker go out? Is it me or is it the battery? What? My eyeglasses? Is that bad? Hello, hello. I think no, the battery's out. I'll yell. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So it literally was 3.30 on a Friday afternoon. Uh, they called up from a hospital in another city with a education program saying that they wanted me to tell them the dose of hydrocortisone to give a boy that they felt had Addison's disease. And I was like, yeah, you need to send him over here. And uh, so the, the, we want to manage him. I was like, yeah, no, you're sending him over here. So after a few minutes, they agreed to send him over here. His sodium had been low. He had been admitted about four times over the last couple of months. His sodium was always low. His potassium, kind of high. And the referring physician swore to me he was not bronzed. Oops. He had been weak and tired. He had been irritable for a few months. He had been craving pickles, potato chips. He salts his potato chips if he can. And two male cousins, his mother's sister's sons, had died of uh, something to do with the adrenal gland. They lived in Florida. Can anybody pick out the kid who isn't bronzed? Yeah, he's not photobombing. He just, uh, he actually belongs to those people who are kind of like me, pasty white. And, you know. Uh, and that was him in the summer. Mom shared that photo with me and said I could use it. And this was him in February when he came into the hospital. And he's still pretty well bronzed when you compare him to the rest of the family. Uh, so you have to be able to recognize bronzing to be able to say somebody's bronze. His sodium was low. His potassium, they had been giving him some sodium, so his potassium wasn't too bad. Bicarb was low, chloride was low, cortisol was low, didn't go up. His plasma renin was elevated because his ACTH worked great. It gave him a great suntan, but it couldn't do anything for his adrenal gland, which had been destroyed by his adrenal leukodystrophy. His urinary sodium was elevated, and that urinary sodium is a key. If you see a high urinary sodium with a low serum sodium, you either have adrenal insufficiency or a really sick kidney. So what else do you need for a guy like this? Well, you need an MRI to look at his brain to see if he has white matter lesions, and you need to get very long chain fatty acids, which is the diagnostic test for adrenal leukodystrophy, and his very long chain fatty acids were quite elevated. So he was uh, sort of uh, a case that gave us a good example. And I had a sad thing recently where I had to be uh, an expert witness because uh, somebody had correctly diagnosed a child with adrenal insufficiency and was correctly treating him, which sounds great. But he felt that since adrenal leukodystrophy was rare, Nobody he saw could possibly have it. Okay, you're seeing somebody with adrenal insufficiency, which really I wouldn't call common. So the whole point of the deposition while I was being deposed was what is the meaning of the word rare? Because that was his defense. <laughs> and I was like, uh, I looked it up later on and found out 
It is completely jurisdictional. In some jurisdictions, rare is one in 2,000, which means most of what I see is rare. And in other jurisdictions, it's one in 200,000. So, you know, don't uh, rely on a jurisdictional distinction to prevent you from evaluating a child appropriately. I don't think it's justifiable. So the diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency, it's really based on an ACTH stimulation and the cortisol should be greater than 18 micrograms per cent. If you can't do that, if you have somebody who is severely ill and fantastically sick and super stressed and you get an ACTH on them that isn't elevated and a cortisol that is less than 18 micrograms per cent, you might treat them with glucocorticoid and other appropriate medications and then we can sort it out when they are well. Uh, for mineralocorticoid competence, we look at renin and aldosterone levels and always, if you're making a diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency, seek a specific diagnosis. It's really important. And this I uh, robbed from the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, I think, or it was robbed from, it was reproduced there. Uh, if you have adrenal insufficiency, infants, uh, children who look like they're having uh, problems, we look at a 17-hydroxyprogesterone. We're looking for adrenal hyperplasia. Uh, we're looking for the adrenal congenital hypoplasia, uh, idiopathic primary adrenal insufficiency. Idiopathic is kind of, make sure you've ruled everything else out before you call it idiopathic, please. Uh, so we look at the 17-hydroxyprogesterone or we look at 21-hydroxylase antibodies. If the 21-hydroxylase antibodies are negative, we CT the adrenals. Uh, we can see infiltrative disease. We can see adrenal hemorrhage. They might be enlarged due to infections. There may be malignant tumors. Uh, and here's the other one. Very long chain fatty acids if the 21 hydroxylase antibodies are negative because we may be dealing with adrenoleukodystrophy. Is there a great treatment for adrenoleukodystrophy? Adrenoleukodystrophy is a disease that affects the white matter of the brain. It's a progressive peroxisomal disease and it affects the adrenal gland. It results, basically the cells can't clean themselves out. They accumulate large amounts of abnormal fatty acids that become an irritant and result in inflammation, resulting in dementia if it's in your brain, which is not reversible, and adrenal insufficiency, which we can treat with mineralocorticoid and glucocorticoid replacement. But just because we can treat the adrenal gland, we can also put patients in touch with folks who can work with the very long-chain fatty acids. There's suggestion that stem cell transplant may be good. There are experimental protocols. The folks at Duke University and at Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore are very interested in seeing these patients. At Kennedy Krieger Institute, they are still using Lorenzo's oil, and everybody has seen that movie. Uh, and it was pretty much true. Hugo Mosier has passed away. He was the physician who came up with it. But it's still available. I've had several patients that were on it. And whether it was luck, whatever, their CNS uh, problems did not progress. But this is a disease that is very individually specific. 
Uh, you can have the same gene defect in a family. One child will present with dementia. Their brother may never develop dementia, may just develop adrenal insufficiency. So it's very wide, very scary, uh, very difficult for the family, but the family should be given the option of seeking every therapy available for their child. And you can only do that if you look for the therapies. With the adrenal gland, uh, my mentor, Maria New, used to get herself in trouble because in the newborn period she felt that disorders of intersex were an emergency for the family that should be addressed immediately and completely and explained to the family so that we can give them a diagnosis, give them an idea of what they're dealing with before they go home from the hospital. Uh, she is still teaching and working at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. She was at Cornell when I was there many years ago. Wonderful grand old lady. A bit wild, but really wonderful. Treatment. We just have two things to offer. Actually, three. Uh, we can give glucocorticoids, if they are glucocorticoid deficient, and we have a really weird way of dosing them. Endocrinologists love weird units. You know, growth hormone, we talk about milligrams per kilogram per week. Glucocorticoids, we talk about milligrams per meter squared per day, and we divide it usually three or four times a day, three times a day if somebody's just getting maintenance, and we may go up to four times a day. And some of my colleagues really, uh, Rob Rappaport up at Mount Sinai, who runs the parallel program to Marie's, <laughs> uh, gets kind of wild, uh, feels that if somebody is severely sick, it is probably better to give the glucocorticoid as a continuous infusion. Uh, I'm not of that school because then you have so many infusions going sometimes that it gets confusing and gives me a headache. Uh, for stress dosing, uh, we triple that and we're up around, we triple the upper limit. So we're getting up to around 45 milligrams per meter squared per day. Our mineralocorticoids, we titrate with Florinef. 9-alpha-fluorohydrocortisone, which is a great mineralocorticoid activity. In the past, it used to be DOCA tablets, and you took the DOCA tablet and made a little nick in the kid's back, pushed the tablet in and sewed it up, and the kid's blood pressure would go up over about a month. They'd be hypertensive a little bit for about a month, and their blood pressure would go down, and then you took the old tablet out and put another tablet in. Uh, Florinef is a lot nicer. We can give it once or twice a day as we need. Now, with some uh, babies, if they've had a severe insult, and even some older children, if they've had a severe insult and have had some renal tubular damage, the Florinef doesn't work as well as it should initially, and it takes time for the kidney to get better. So you have to supplement them with salt. Well, how much salt do you need? The most I've given is 20 milliequivalents of sodium per kilo per day, which is humongous. That's like you're eating a salt shaker every day and you're a tiny little kid. You're salting your pickle juice and you are putting salt on your potato chips heavily. Uh, but they need it and it is an appropriate thing to do. Now, one of my Dax boys, the first one, uh, came in and he was hypertensive. And I realized, I asked mom, have you been giving him a lot of salt? And she was, no. And I was like, is he eating a lot of, you know, I was just trying everything. And then all of a sudden, I saw a light go on in mom's eyes. They had a salt water swimming pool. And he had a pacifier. And he would dip his pacifier in the swimming pool <laughs> and get his salt fix. So people will get salt in a lot of different weird ways if they need it. But you can be guaranteed they will find it. Uh, so we're getting close to the end. This is a little photograph I took at 
uh, let's see, I believe that is Lamar Valley in Yellowstone in 2011, July. Uh, relaxing, something to relax your mind before you go off to the clinic to cure. Are there any questions that you might have? I can't have made it that clear. <laughs> we know your number. <laughs> Thanks. Don't publish it. <laughs> it already is. <laughs> Curses. Okay. And Sometimes we face these kids who have problems with part of our the basic kids who test. All I have is this little uh, Victoria was a normative level. You do the ACT simulation test. We don't understand in preemies and we want the diagonal variation in the response. Would you get on the There should be a level of if you're what are you doing the what are you doing the test for? Are you looking at all metabolites or just for glucocorticoid? It should be, you should have a response greater than 18. It doesn't matter where you start out. You should have a response uh, that takes it up to greater eight than 18. It doesn't really matter what the diurnal variation is. If your response isn't greater than 18, you've got to be scratching your head and worrying about it. It doesn't matter where you start, it's where you end. Any time of the day can do that. Any time of the day. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Doesn't matter what time of the day. And it's really simple. The pharmacy is very helpful for the low dose ACTH stimulation test, getting you your one microgram of ACTH since the vials come to 50 micrograms. Uh, there, you know, pharmacy has been really nice at least doing it at any time. We've asked them and we've done some of them at really weird times of the day and uh, the folks have been great in, uh, because it is important and if you can get a specific diagnosis the sooner you have a specific diagnosis for the people the more comfortable you are putting somebody on therapy saying they need therapy and being able to explain to the parents why they need the therapy thank you, thank you.